probably the only satin flame over chrome over brass drum in existence. I'm the Curmudgeon Drum Maker, and in this special edition of the Curmudgeon Drum Lab, we're going to look at some of the tools I use to refurbish and build drums. I cut my own bearing edges with a small router table. I have a friend who can do this freehand, but I modified mine with some guide wheels so that I can do it more effectively. An inside set for inside bearing edges, and a different configuration for outside bearing edges. My training wheels helped me quite a bit in making good edges and I added a little bit of an extension shelf to help stabilize the shell while I'm spinning it. As you can see, it makes a nice clean edge. And here's the first production piece I made after some practice runs, clean and smooth. Laying out whole drilling locations on the shell for lugs and other hardware by hand is somewhat error prone, so I built a machine to help. It has a turntable with an instrument that measures rotation angle and then I use a laser projector and a digital height finder so that I can set the location projected onto the shell where each hole goes in terms of both location around the circumference and height. There is a mechanism to center up the shell on the turntable. The machine makes it very easy to rapidly lay out hole patterns for the entire shell. In a large company, when they make a production run of stock drums, they use a CNC machine and they don't really have to do this. I used to do all the drilling by hand, but I recently modified a drill press to make this easier. I added these rollers, but they're pretty slippery, so I also created a little break so that I could set the rollers in place and release them temporarily when I needed to roll the shell. This makes it very easy to line up the hole pattern with the laser projector on the drill and efficiently drill the holes. Measuring transient or impulse response requires a low echo chamber. This is not a soundproof room, it's an anechoic chamber, and it requires damping so that you don't get sound bouncing off the walls. There's a standard stick drop machine so that you'll do the same hit on the drum every time. It even has a dial to measure rebound of the stick. Some people use that for sensitivity. And a high precision recording device collects waveforms, which are then input to software to do Fourier and other kinds of analysis. This allows measurement of attack, decay, damping, and so on. The resonance test cell inputs variable frequency sound into the drum and measures the response of the drum to locate resonant frequencies. There's a fixture that holds the drum over the speaker. There are special non-contact optical sensors to measure the response of the drum without loading it down. And that entire fixture then is connected to an electronics package. The electronics package has a frequency generator that can be swept through various frequencies and a scope to look at the signals coming from the sensors. On the scope, the lower trace shows the input signal to the drum. The upper trace shows the sensor output for the selected sensor. Off resonance, it looks like noise. At resonance, you see a signal, and it makes it very easy to detect and measure the resonant frequency. The drum resonance calculator is a complex piece of software that can calculate the six resonance frequencies that we talked about in an earlier episode of this series. It does quite a bit of mathematics to do so, and it uses the characteristics of the drum, the materials, and the geometries of the drum to do those calculations. And finally, this instrument measures membrane tension, which we need to calculate drum resonant frequencies. Now listen to the most popular snare drum in history, the Ludwig Superphonic. <laughs> 